皆さんこんにちは、えー、本日は BOP に関わります東西山の主催いたします講演会に大変多くの方にご参加いただきまして大変ありがとうございます BOP という言葉につきましては Bottom of the Pyramid or Base of the Pyramid の略,略語であるということはすでに日本でもよく知られていることかと存じます途上国の低所得者省を対象といたしました持続可能な貧困問題を中心とした社会的課題の解決に資することが期待される新しいビジネスモデルについては、欧米企業や国際機関等を中心に、現在、活発に行われつつあります。日本でも2009年頃からでしょうか、BOP 層を対象としたさまざまな議論が盛り上がり、JICA、JETRO、あるいは他の国際機関等の公的支援等の後押しもありまして、多くの企業、あるいは社会起業家の方々が、貧困とビジネスの両立という新たな課題に取り組んでいらっしゃいます。ここまでお話しいたしますと、それでは、えー、本日、こちらにおいでになった方々は、じゃあ、なんであの財団がこんなことをしてるんだろうかというふうに思う方もいらっしゃるかもしれません。実は本日の、えー、午後に、えーアドバイザリーボードのミーティングをしたんですが、やはりそこでも財団の役割というのはどういうものかというようなことがあの話し合われました。で、あの私はアメリカ、それから日本の財団であの働く機会がございましたけれども、特にアメリカの財団では、社会的課題の解決、中でもあの貧困問題ということに取り組む財団が数多くございます。で、えー、貧困問題というのは非常にあの古くて、しかもなかなか解決し,てしきれていないと。非常に解決が困難な問題であるというふうに言うことがあのできるかと思いますけれども、まあ、フォード財団、あるいはロックフェラー財団というような、えー、名だたる財団をもとより、いろいろな財団がさまざまな形で、えー、米国内、あるいは、えー、アフリカ、あるいはアジア等の開発途上国の貧困問題に取り組んできたということが言えると思いますし、また各国の ODA 機関はそれ,それこそより大規模な資金を持って事業をされてきたというふうに考えております。で特にあの財団、あるいはそ,のそういった ODA 機関等の中では、やはり貧困問題を解決するためには、現地のニーズや事情をよく汲み取って、あるいは現地の方々の参加意識を高めるということが必要であろうということを考えてまいりまして、例えば、住民参加のアプローチ、あるいは住民の方々の地位を向上させるアプローチというようなことを言ってみたり、あるいは米国で成功してきたコミュニティファウンデーションのようなものを各地で作ったらどうかというようなコミュニティファウンデーションのモデルを各国に紹介するような事業を行ってみたり、あるいはサウスとサウスコラボレーションといいまして、やはりその発展途上国の方々があの同じようなあのたあの問題を持っている方々と共に助け合うようなことをしたらどうかというふうにいろいろな形で、えー、事業を行ってきたと、まさに試行錯誤ということが言われるかと思います。ただあの財団の場合最後にはやはやりいかに現地の方々と非常に信頼をベースにした、あるいはもう少しキャンディドというんでしょうか、非常にあの意思疎通を、非常に自由かったな議論をすることができるような関係にしていくかというのは非常に難しいところがありまして、それは突き詰めるところを言うと、私たち財団というのは、グラントを出す財団であり、そして途上国の方々はそれを受けるという立場から、なかなかそういう、えーまあ、あの通過という言葉が日本にありますけれども、あのまあ、キャンディットな関係というのをなかなか作れないということがあったかと思います。でそういう中で、BOP というこのアプローチは、低所得者層の方々があの支援をされるということだけではなくて、やはりあの提供される技術や製品をあの消費していく。あるいは場合によっては、生産あるいは販売の一翼を担うパートナーとして、より対等な立場で参加、このような開発の参加が可能になっているということが非常に優れた点の一つであろうかと思います。まあ、いろいろあのお話をいただきますと、そんなに簡単なことではなくて、やはりいろいろなあの難しい問題はあるというふうには伺っておりますけれども、やはり基本は、やはりパートナーとしての参加を可能にしているというところが非常に大きいのではないかというふうに思います。また近年はやはりあの
欧米諸国と、まあまあ、支援をしている国からの支援疲れといつまで支援をしていっても問題が解決しないじゃないかとそういう支援疲れというものもある中でやはりサステイナブルなアプローチということであるとこの通常の企業あるいは社会企業等の活動の中で開発課題の解決が図っていけるということがあの非常に優れたこのアプローチの点であるというふうに考えます。であの財団と言いますのはえーまあ、社会的課題の有効な解決策というのをいち早く注目いたしまして、それが円滑に機能するための、まあ、環境づくりをお手伝いする、あるいは調査研究等を支援する、それから財団の持つネットワークという機能をあの有効に駆使して、まあ、非常それこそベース・オブ・ザ・ピラミッドから、あるいは政府関係者といろんなあの立場の方々とのネットワークを、えー、可能にしながら、えー、そういういろいろなバツなぎをする、あるいは情報の発信をしていくといういろいろなあの形でのお手伝いができるのではないかというふうに私どもは考えております。で、実際にあの笹川平和財団では、えー、今年度からなんですけれども、やはりあの日本の企業、やはりコストが高い日本の企業が、まあ、遠く離れた事情もあまりよくわからない途上国の市場を対象とした BOP ビジネスに取り組むに際して、まあ、いろいろな困難な点もあるんじゃないかと。いうことを考えまして、日本の BOP ビジネスを後押ししていくために、BOP 技術のインキュベーションをサポートする事業というものを立ち上げております。で、またそのプロジェクトには、世界の BOP ビジネスの第一人者とされる方々がアドバイザリーボードのメンバーになっていただいております。本日、こちらにいらっしゃってますあの、ミシガン大学のテッド・ロンドン教授、それから一橋大学イノベーション研究センターの米倉誠一郎教授、そして国連開発計,計画のサバ・ソバーニ様、またアジア開発銀行の、えー、アーミン・バウアー様です。本当にあのどうもありがとうございます。そしてまたこういうあの素晴らしい方々がアドバイザリーボードとなっていただきましたことを機に、あの今回こちらで講演会をしようというふうに考えた次第でございます。また本日の会議にはご多忙にもかかわりませず、経済,経済産業省の通商金融経済協力課長の森様、それからオーストラリアに、あそしてオランダにあります国連大学マーストリヒト技術革新,革新経済社会研究所のシュアン・サドレガ氏にもご参加いただいております。本日のご参加、大変ありがとうございます。で、最後に本日のこの会議に、えー、ご来場いただきました皆様に心より御礼を申し上げまして、私のご挨拶とさせていただきます。本日はどうもありがとうございました。では、開会の授業、一橋大学イノベーション研究,研究センターの米倉誠一郎教授よりいただきます。米倉教授は1995年より、一橋大学商学部産業経営研究所教授、97年より同大学イノベーション研究センター教授をされており、その他、プレトリア大学 GIBS ビジネススクール日本研究センター所長、機関士、一橋ビジネスレビュー編集委員長、アカデミーヒルズ、日本元気塾、塾長も務めます。られておりますイノベーションを核とした企業の経営戦略と発展プロセス組織の私的研究をご専門とされ多くの経営者から熱い支持を受けられていらっしゃいます著者は創発的破壊未来をつくるイノベーション経営革新の構造と多数ございます米倉先生よろしくお願いいたします、はいえー、皆さんこんにちは、えー、すごいですねこれだけやっぱり集まるというのは僕たちの予想では半分ぐらいじゃないかと思っていたんですけれどもやっぱりそれだけ BOP で今日3つ言いたいことがありまして、まず1つはですね、BOP っていうのは、極めて大きいだけじゃなくて、大切な市場ですよね、まあ、1日2ドル以下で暮らしている人が40億人、今、地球の人口は70億ですから、もう大半はそういう人たちだと、でも、1日2ドルで40億っていうことは、1日80億ドルですから、約8000億円が毎日のように、あれ消費されていると。でこれは極めて大きなマーケットですし、えー、それをきちっと育てる、えー、それは世界にとって重要な課題だと思うんですがそこにこの我々が今生きているシステムを持っていったらば地球は絶対に持ちませんよねそうするとここでやっぱりサステイナブルっていうことがキーワードになってきて我々がずっと研究しているイノベーションやっぱり新しいフレームワークがなければこのマーケットをインクルーシブに
考えることはできない。ですから2番目に言いたいのは大きなマーケットだけれどもイノベーションが必要でそのイノベーションにとって僕は日本は非常に重要な役割を果たせると思ってるんですね。であの今テッド・ロンドンさんと話してて「いや日本も BOP だったんだよ」と僕は言いましたけど本当にそうですよね。えー、いきなり江戸から明治になった時も我々ちょんまげ言ってですよ着物着てたわけですからそれはそれなりに深い文化がありましたけれどもある種<笑>いきなり世界に巻き込まれてで、まあ、戦争でほとんど何もなくなった上野の山から品川の海が見えるっていう状況からまたここまで来たわけですから日本がやってきたテクノロジーえー、僕はプレトリア大学の日本研究センター所長をやってるんですけどアフリカはやっぱり1リットル100円なんですねガソリンってでまあブック水準が半分だとしたら彼らは200円バングラダシュでもほとんど買わない物価水準が10分の1ですから1000円1リットル1000円の車に乗ってるわけですよね電気料金もそうですしそうすると日本の省エネのテクノロジーとかまあ、日本がこの原発3月11日を契機にですねもっと少ないエネルギーでもっと豊かに暮らせる方法を作ればそれはそのまま世界に行くんですよねでそのテクノロジーだけじゃなくてですね水これ大事ですけど我々考えてみたら一体いつから日本人は水にお金を払うようになったんだろうとそれはいつから物価連動してインフレーションに乗っていくようになったんだろう誰が責任を持っていたんだろう実はこうした日本のインフラストラクチャーの作り方だって世界に輸出できる立派なノウハウなんですよねでそのことを我々は忘れたで3つ目の話はですねでもそうしたものはまさに今リバースイノベーションと言,いますけど言われてますけれども全部先進国に帰ってくるんですよね我々が10分の1で過ごせるテクノロジーを開発したらそれは途上国にとっても重要ですけれども日本にとって一番重要ですよね僕は原発はやらない方がいいと思ってるんですがそこういう道にも開けていくしでそういう意味で考えるとですね BOP っていうのはマーケットが大きいだけではなくてイノベーションの源泉でありでそこに日本が活躍できる余地がたくさんある。でそのことはすべて我々の未来に帰ってくるということでですね今私たちのイノベーション研究センターも、えー、この種のイノベーションにものすごく力を入れていますし、えー、そういうふうにサステイナビリティと、えー、競争力をどうやって、えー、共存させるかまさにそのキーが、えー、このマーケットにあるような気がするので、えー、今日のシンポジウムを非常に楽しみにしています今日はありがとうございました。井倉先生ありがとうございました、えー、それでは本日の基調講演、えーえー、本日あ今日のあ今日の BOP ビジネスより良い BOP ビジネスの構築をミシガン大学ウィリアム・デイビッドソン・インスティテュートのテッド・ロンドン教授よりいただきますビジネス戦略と貧困削減の接点を探る研究において国際的に認知された専門家でいらっしゃり2011年に出版されたシュチュワート・ハートとの共著 BOP ビジネス市場競争の戦略では貧困の軽減を真に支援することのできる拡張性と採算性ある事業の構築に関する新たな盗撮を展開されていますまた米国内外の大学経営大学院またエグゼクティブを対象としたプログラムにおいて BOP 層を対象とした経営戦略及び持続可能な企業発展をご専門として指導に当たられていらっしゃいます。どんどん先生、ではよろしくお願いいたします。Great to be here. Thank you for that wonderful introduction.、Um, this is,、uh, I think, my third visit to Japan, but、uh, it's been a long time. And it's wonderful to be back, and particularly wonderful to see so much interest in this idea of base of the pyramid. And I want to thank Sasakawa and UNU Merit and UNDP and, and all the others that have been engaged in beginning to push these ideas forward in Japan.、Um, thank you for inviting me, and、uh, thank all of you for coming to, to have an opportunity to, to have a discussion about this. The way this session will go today,、uh, as I understand it, is I'm going to 
present for about 45 minutes. Marie is going to talk a little bit more about uh, what the Sasakawa Peace Foundation is going to have, go going to be doing. Uh, I think we're going to take a little break, and then we'll have a chance for question and answer and a discussion. So I say that just because um, I usually enjoy to, to have questions after the presentation or even during, but in this case, I think it's structured so that uh, I'll be taking some questions with some really other distinguished members uh, after this session, after a coffee break. Have I gotten that right? I don't want to mess up the schedule here. Okay, so um, when, when we talked about this uh, presentation, they said uh, you have about 45 minutes. Um, there's audiences, the audience will come from business, from nonprofits, maybe some students, some government people, and they'll have a whole range of uh, background on the topic. And I went, huh, that's, uh, that's an interesting challenge to try and cover everyone and, and everything. So what, I, what I'm going to do is, is build off what was said before and assume that there's a little bit of knowledge about base of the pyramid. And then what I'll talk about is kind of three big things here. Um, one is sort of what do we know so far about this field? What have we learned about it? Um, the second is um, kind of what are the successes has been? What have the challenges been? And then a little bit of a view towards the future in the sense of where might we go uh, as we look ahead? So talk about current, the, st the current state of affairs, the lessons learned, and maybe a vision of the future. So if you look at the, the first picture, it, it says um, a need for new approaches. And this is, what you'll see is um, a number of kids looking. Can you see all that? I want to make sure we're all together. Do you, do you see that picture? I could hold it up here, but I have a teeny tiny version, so I don't know if you can see it. But it's this idea that, and I took this picture, um, and it's sort of given away if you look at the slides, but I took this picture when I worked in Malawi in 1989. And what I'm doing is I'm looking through a window at kids, and they're at school. And when you look at that, what do you see? What you see is, what I would argue is children with an, an intelligence, and a motivation equal to what's in the room today. What you don't see is any books, desks. They have one, usually one teacher teaching the entire class. Um, and, and you go, wow, this is what development's all about. This is where we really need to help them. And it's also, um, I think, a, a sober reminder of that could be us, but by luck of where we were born. And then if you look in the lower right, you'll see a second picture. And I took that picture more than 20 years later uh, in the same area of the world, this time in Kenya. And you look, and again, oh, are we getting there? It's catching up? <laughs> there you go. So, so you look at it again, and you say, well, what's this? And you know, you've seen the slide. And again, it's, it's kids at school. And maybe things have improved a little bit, but after 20 some odd years of development work, what have we really achieved? And there's a sense now in the development community, and you're beginning to hear it now, that we need to think about new approaches. And um, this is sort of reiterated by a, a couple of pieces. One is this idea that, you know, and we can count this in a lot of ways, but something like $2.3 trillion has been spent in development. And very few people would argue that we've achieved all that we aspire to. Bill Easterly, who's written, and he, he's sort of a, a, a critic of this, but he writes, and he's now talking about Africa, that after 40 some odd years and, and half a trillion dollars, Africa remains in economic stagnation. You know, a very kind of bleak view. And you might say, well, he's an outsider. Well, here's a quote from the Secretary General of the United Nations. So far, our collective record is mixed, the results suggest that there have been some gains and that success is still possible in most parts of the world. But they also point to how much remains to be done. The sense that we need to think about poverty differently, and, and certainly our colleagues at UNDP, among others, have begun to kind of push this idea. And part of the idea is under the right market conditions, the private sector can alleviate poverty and contribute to human development in new ways. 
So what we're seeing is you know, one sector, which is the, the sort of the, the development sector, beginning to think about a greater role for market-based approaches. And then there's a second big trend, and this has to do with companies, right? So if you're in a large company, any size company, do you have any idea what world growth is supposed to be in the developed world in the foreseeable future? You know, it'll go up and down a little bit, but do you know what it's going to be? It's going to average about 2.6%. Now, if you're running a company and you go to your board and you say, well, you know what? We're going to match the world growth. What, is your board going to give you a, a big bonus and a raise? Right, so this is the idea that we need to think about new sources of growth, new organic sources of growth. And I borrowed this slide from Eduardo Wanek, who's part of the top management team at a, at a company called DuPont. And when he talks about base of the pyramid, he uses this. And the real point here is that it's very, very difficult for companies to find organic growth. Most companies, as they get bigger, they grow by merger and acquisition. And the question he poses when he talks to his, his managers is, where is the growth for the future going to come from? And what we're seeing now is more companies, and this comes from some colleagues at, um, at the, the IFC, is more companies are now thinking about business opportunities at the base of the pyramid. So these are just uh, a number of investments that the IFC has participated in, and it gives you a sense you know, across the globe that there are some opportunities, there are some models now appearing that have some sense of scale and that serve the base of the pyramid. And what this really leads to is this idea of bringing together two domains that have historically been separated. One is kind of the business side to say, the business challenges, we always have to find new customers, we need to locate new sources of supply, where are we gonna find growth for the future? So it's really this search for new opportunities. And frankly, the development community, their challenge isn't where do we find customers, they have too many customers. They need to address a lack of market opportunities, and, and I would argue, um, and maybe I'm, a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm slightly biased, but I think the biggest challenge for development is creating scale. How do we use our money and get it to scale, to sustain and scale? And what's made this, this kind of base of the pyramid so attractive is it's bringing these two together to say, there is a way to create mutual value. Business initiatives targeting growth and profits can be aligned with the development community's efforts to alleviate poverty. Can we bring these two together in a way that benefits both? Can we create economically viable businesses that also have significant poverty alleviation implications? And the answer is yes, but. And we'll get to the but. The but is really we need to learn more. We've made progress, but we need to keep going further. So why now? Why is all this interest in base of the pyramid occurring in the last couple of decades? There's one big driver in my mind that's doing this. And, and some people say it's technology and they'll say it's uh, kind of greater transparency and more awareness and greater conflict. And I think those are all true. But I believe, in my mind, the biggest driver is population. And this just gives you a sense, maybe, that, you know, if you look at the world's population, we're at about 7 billion now. No one's quite sure, but they think around 2050 we'll get to somewhere between 9 and 10 billion people. And if you think about that, those three, 2 to 3 billion more people, where are they going to be born into? Are they going to be born into Japan, America, Europe? Are they going to be born to the wealthy in India? Now, almost all are going to be born in the developing world in base of the pyramid markets. So if you think about it, we've talked about the base of the pyramid being four billion, some say five. And if you think that's a development problem, wait till it gets to seven or eight billion. And if you're a business and you're saying there are four or five billion underserved customers, that number is only going to grow. And then I use my lifetime as a, as a reference point. So I was born in 1963. 
Um, so those of you who can do math will pretty quickly figure out that I'm going to turn 50 this year. Um, in my lifetime, in my 50 years, the population of the world has more than doubled. There have been, more, there have been almost 4 billion people born in this planet in the last 50 years in my lifetime. And I would argue almost all of them in what we're calling base of the pyramid. And if you look out ahead, and, and if you root for me, and you hope that I make, um, let's, let's all hope I make 87 years old, at least. So in my lifetime, 87 years, the population will have nearly tripled. Six billion more people on the planet. That's why now. And almost all that growth, again, is coming in the base of the pyramid. So all those things that we're worried about for the base of the pyramid are all only going to magnify. And all those opportunities, they're only going to get more interesting over time. Am I? Right. And, and certainly in this field, there's growing momentum, right? I mean, so it's, it's not just an idea. It's growing momentum. Um, this, I'm at the University of Michigan, so this, this chart is a little bit Michigan-centric. But a, a lot has happened at Michigan. You know, we're, we're, we're very proud to be one of the forerunners in this whole space, and there's been a number of major events. And, and if we were only to count what we would call, we use the term buzzwords, we would be doing great. Because we started with base of the pyramid, but out of that has come a whole lot of similar words. And we, we can debate the nuances of the exact definitions, but they're all centered around the idea that business can play a role in serving and meeting the needs of the poor. And people use different definitions for it, but it's all around the same thing. And that certainly exploded. You know, Bill Gates has gotten in and, and he uses the term creative capitalism. Rockefeller Foundation uses impact enterprises. One of the major development banks calls it opportunities for the majority, but it's all around that same idea. And certainly, you know, these are just some of our, our partner organizations. There's an awful lot of different companies, nonprofits, foundations, universities thinking about this. But I'm going to argue so far they've had mixed success. I want to talk a little bit about what we've learned so far about that and why that's the case. And by the way, mixed success isn't bad. Whenever you try something new, there's going to be a learning phase. The challenge for us is to figure out what do we know after a decade or so, and how can that help us improve our success rate? And that's kind of where, where we're really focused at. And one of the things I'll, 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 I'll tell you, and I, I strongly believe, is that the way we frame the issues influences the questions we ask. So how we think about problems influences the questions. And I'll just give you an example. Um, and I guess this is a, a little bit of a self-promotion, and I'm delighted to say this. our book was translated into, into Japanese, but we, we, uh, Stu Hart and I and some other folks put out a, a book a couple of years ago, and the whole idea was to reframe how we think about the base of the pyramid. And for those of you who know the field, know it started with something like this. Is there a fortune at the base of the pyramid? And that led to debates about how big is the fortune? You know, if someone makes money, how is that fortune allocated? And then it got to very, you know, uninteresting questions about you know, exactly how many people are at what poverty line. And, and, but it became very much about a fixed pie and how do we get some of that pie? And I think it was a great way to start the field, but it leads to the wrong questions. One of the questions that it tends to lead to, for example, is are base of the pyramid ventures good or bad for the poor? And I think that is a very intriguing yet useless question. And I'll explain in a minute. Where we think the field has to go is how do you create a fortune with the base of the pyramid? And it's only changing a few words, but I really think it fundamentally changes how we think about this space. When you are trying to create something, you're trying to make something more than currently exists. And it's much more, the first one about is there a fortune, it's sort of like there's the $5 bill on the ground and it's really about executing to get it. And when you talk about creating, it becomes much more of an innovation orientation. And I think that's what this space needs, is we need to think about this as innovation and creation 
And then this idea of with becomes critically important, that this is new territory, and we have to create ventures with the development community, with new partners, with the base of the pyramid. And I think that, you know, that's a very different question. And when it comes back to the other question I asked you about, how do you make, vent are, are BOP ventures good or bad for the poor? I think is the wrong, again, the wrong question because you end up in a debate where some people say, well, here's a venture I like and here's a venture I don't like. It really doesn't matter what we say in Tokyo about whether ventures are good or bad for the poor. Business is still gonna serve the poor. So a much better question for us is, how do we make BOP ventures work better for the poor? They're not going away. And again, it leads to a very, very different set of questions looking ahead. And what I'll talk about for the next few minutes is I think three broad principles that you wanna think about when, you, when you're thinking about this fortune creating approach. The first is, you know, this is different. This business's environment is different. So enterprise leaders need to have a set of guiding principles. You know, what can they leverage? What's new? How do we really understand and execute in this environment? The second is, I think there has to be an interaction with development community investments. You know, I gave you that number of $2.3 trillion. You know, if a, a portion of that can be invested to support business development, it can be very, very powerful in catalyzing some of the activities. And then the last is, you know, if these ventures are indeed about serving the poor, we darn well better understand the value creation proposition for them. And we'll talk a little bit about each one of these going forward. So I put this up, and we talked about this already. So, and I don't know that this has a, a little red light or not. Let's see. One of the things I like to do, just to, to get you thinking, this, we, we talked about this already, but, you know, so I've cheated, but it, I would ask you to sort of say, here we are in the, the global economic pyramid. Tell me when to stop when we've reached kind of where you think you fit in this pyramid. Here? Here? I know that there are probably a few students who feel very poor. So maybe here, here. Yeah. All of you are probably right in here. We are the richest people on the planet by far, right? And there are lots of ways of, and this is sort of the most traditional way of thinking about the base of the pyramid, but there are lots of other ways of, of of cutting this and, and different criteria. To me, what makes this space so interesting is generally this is about serving people that primarily live in the informal economy. Right. I don't mean the illegal, illicit informal economy. I mean the informal economy that lacks institutions. And this means that for businesses, it's a very, very different business environment. And that means that you have to set aside some of your biases, some of your existing notions. And I just put this up to get you to think about it. So this is just kind of a, an illustrative example. If we close our eyes and we think about a map of the world, can you imagine that in your mind now? What does a map of the world look like? What happened? What happens if all the maps of the world are drawn like this? Do we just fall off the planet? Right? Who says north has to be up? And you know, I, when I do this, my friends in, in South Africa, they love it, because they're sort of right in the center of the world now. And the Brazilians, they think this is great too. I don't know quite what it means for Japan because you sort of sort of haven't changed that much, but certainly in the developing world, it now brings them to the top of the map. And if all the maps were like this, you might think of the world a little differently. But has the world changed? Or just the way we think about it? And that's what I want to do at the base of the pyramid. So I asked you earlier, when we had a little mechanical glitch, to think about three terms you'd use to describe the base of the pyramid. 
I can't really do a, a question and answer, but what I'll ask you is, did any of you consider the base of the pyramid as co-creators of the value proposition, as colleagues, co-inventors, partners? Most people tend to think of them as recipients and students. They're as smart as we are. We can't build viable businesses without a deep understanding of local needs. And it's interesting, I worked, um, in, uh, I worked for McCormick, which is a, a large spice company in the US, as a general manager. And I ran a, a, um, uh, a joint venture for them. I was a general manager in Indonesia. And who do you think all these people are? In general, I'm running a pretty large joint venture. This is my top management team. All right. This is Zafro Zamzami. He's my procurement manager. The two guys on the ends, they're head of the local cooperatives, the Cooperasa Unit Desa. So technically, they're, they're part of my, um, my board. And then a number of these are farmers and the like. But these are the people that I have to work with to make sure the venture was successful. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass on this slide other than just to say that I think one of the biggest challenges for any organization, companies or otherwise, is really committing to hear the voices of the poor. If you were running a business serving a new market in Japan, you would spend a lot of time trying to understand the needs of that market you were seeking to serve. Too many companies, too many development initiatives assume they know best. They go in and say, we know we're going to tell you what to do. That is a fundamentally flawed assumption that has led to an awful lot of failure. They don't know. And by not talking, you would never do that in the developed world. You would never not talk to your potential customers. I mean, to me, that's a blatant lack of respect for the poor. They need to be part of the value creation process. And, and we do a lot of work with, with companies, including multinationals. And one of the things that we ask them to do is, as I put here, is to develop guidelines for engaging with working with the poor that they can incorporate across their team. And you know, that takes some time to make sure that the entire team has a process in place that they're aware of, that they can work with the poor and have a conversation. And this leads to, to some work we've done to really think about what are some of the guidelines and steps that companies need to follow. And I, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into them all, but one of them I just talked about was this idea of we need to be able in the earliest stages to craft solutions with the base of the pyramid. I will talk a little bit about what I mean by create market opportunities. Um, going ahead, when you begin to go to pilot, what we find is an awful lot of organizations do what's called, I call, pilots of convenience. If you talk to them, they say, yes, we're working in Tanzania. And I say, well, why are you working in Tanzania? I say, well, this, this partner invited me to come and work with them. I said, well, that's great. This is a pilot. When you're done, what will you have learned? And it's often met with silence. It's an experiment. Pilots need to be done well. They need to be effective. They need to test specific things. And as many pilots are, you need to expect failure. And by managing failure, it's two things. One is it's avoiding what we'll call an escalation of commitment, which we see way too often, which is basically bad ideas keep getting money. Bad ideas need to stop. That's what pilots are about. But when we're doing this, we need to understand where the risk is. Because if you're piloting a business, that's not the same as experimenting on the poor. If pilots fail, the big losers have to be the, the organizations that are supporting the pilots, not the poor. And then I put the last up scale because, at least in my mind, the big win is when we reach scale. And that needs to be thought of from the very beginning. 
What are the sources of competitive advantage going to be in this business? And as we build capabilities, how can we transfer them from location to location? So not unlike what you would think about in terms of scale, in terms of growth for a large company, but it's a different type of competitive advantage and it's a different set of capabilities. But that has to be in the picture as well. And we can talk more, but the point is, there's, we now know enough that we can offer some guidelines that are very specific to running BOP ventures. And then when we talk about market creation, typically partnerships have relied on one of these two models. One is dependence. People like dependence because I'm the more powerful partner and you're dependent on me and that's a great position some people think to be in. And then there's independence where, you know, I'm going to get something from you, but leave me alone, and we're going to kind of continue separately. I think in this space, we need to move to interdependence between partners. And this is very, very difficult because you're talking about organizations that aren't used to working together. We had a, meet, we had a board meeting today, as was mentioned earlier, a big challenge for a lot of companies is feeling comfortable working with nonprofits and development organizations. And a big challenge for nonprofits and development organizations is working with companies in a much, much deeper, rich relationship. Um, if I am a development organization supporting a company or a nonprofit supporting a company initiative, you know, there can be lots of different types of success metrics. How much money did I invest? How many people were involved? How many training programs did I run? None of those matter. If I'm a development organization or a nonprofit working with a company, you know what the best metric is? Venture success. If I don't measure myself against venture success, it doesn't matter. But a lot of development organizations are, are somewhat concerned, or nonprofits, that they don't want to be too tied up in the profit motive. But if you're going to support business, you have to. And for businesses, you have to recognize that your development partners have a particular goal, usually a social goal like poverty alleviation. You may go, my gosh, what do I care about poverty? Well, the answer is alleviating poverty is the same as meeting your customers' needs. The better you alleviate poverty, the better you're meeting your needs, their needs. And what is business based on? Successful business? Meeting people's needs understanding those needs and meeting them. And if you don't understand their needs and how you're meeting them, you're going to fail. So there is a lot of logic to being more interdependent. But that's difficult for organizations that are used to relying on dependence or, or used to trying to craft dependence or, or rely on independence. And I'll just put this up because when you think about it from a development community, there are two ways, and I think this is, a, a, you know, this, is, this is an area of debate, but I think something that needs to really be talked about more. How can the development community facilitate business development in base of the pyramid markets? And I think there are two ways to do this. One is to support individual ventures. And these things, and they've gotten more popular, you know, there's, there's financing. Some of you may know things like impact investing where there's special kinds of, you know, um, if you will, patient money made available. People provide some capacity building. Um, they offer market information. So there's a lot about helping a particular venture be more successful. But what there's not is an effort to also, some people call it building the market ecosystem. It's about market creation. Can we also create a market that doesn't currently exist? We had an interesting conversation today about you know, the opportunities to, for clean water. And there's, there's a significant, and I'll put it in quotes, need. There's a lot of people that drink water that's dirty and, and full of disease. Um, and there's actually a lot of technologies that can respond to that. The biggest challenge I feel, that I've seen, is creating awareness of the benefits of clean water. The idea, the link between dirty water and disease. It's not always well understood. Um, people have been using the same water source for years and years. Um, 
just because you clean the water doesn't make people free of disease, right? They can still get sick from other reasons. And frankly, clean water is a negative benefit, which is hard also to market. The idea is if you drink clean water, nothing happens. That can be hard to sell. And what we've done, and we did work for a long time with Procter & Gamble, who was one of the leaders in a product called Pure. And the biggest challenge they found was really was generating repeat purchases. People just weren't convinced that it was important enough to make an investment in. And the, you know, the way to overcome this, and the challenge for P&G is they could not afford themselves to make an investment in awareness. And you might say, well, why? Because you know, if they do that, they'll change minds and they'll get market. Well, once they make that investment and they change minds, what are all their competitors waiting to do? All right. They're not able to create any competitive advantage. They're not able to own that investment, so they're not likely to make it. So this becomes an area where the development community can play a role and say, we can invest in helping to create awareness and, and if you will, demonstrate the value proposition of this product. Another model might be vouchers. Um, in the U.S., we have a program called food stamps. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's something around $20 billion. And the stamps are given to people with lower incomes. And uh, you know, with those stamps, they don't go to a government warehouse. Right? They go and shop at any supermarket that any wealthy person does. So what the government is doing is basically creating a $20 billion market for the supermarkets. Right, that's market creation. We're, we're fine with that in the developed world. Um, we don't do that so well in the developing world for a variety of reasons, but we need to bring that in and say, how can we do it? And there are you know, a lot of other things we could talk about as well. So the last thing I want to talk about is this idea of enhancing mutual value. And it's something that we do a lot of work on that, you know, and it comes back to what I said before is if we are claiming to want to serve the poor, we darn well better understand how effective we are. Um, and uh, what we've done is, is spent a lot of time and we're continuing to refine this, but we've developed a framework that really helps us understand what are the impacts and the way we think about it is, is multidimensional. That the poor are affected in multi, multiple dimensions and that there are multiple stakeholders that are impacted. How do we begin to understand what those impacts are? And something that I personally dislike a lot is when development organizations or companies use stories to demonstrate impact. If you read a, you know, an annual report of someone that's serving the base of the pyramid, they say, what's our impact? Well, they will get a story of a particular individual. And they'll say, look how we changed their, that person's life. You, know, you don't have to be a statistician to know that how valuable is a, a survey of one. And you add to that survey that it was a selected sample. And then you add to that survey that that information was probably um, concealed a little bit in terms of, of of negative outcomes. I mean, we need to have a much richer, deeper understanding. Um, the way we look at it is, is this is about assessing and enhancing. And we see it, and this is why we have a lot of organizations that work with us, is they use it as a tool to guide their strategy. Right? The better we understand our customers, the better we can meet their needs, the better value proposition we can make for everyone. And that's something we're really focusing on a lot, is really understanding what are the impacts of, of ventures activities and how can we make them better? How can we improve the value proposition? There are a few that say it, it's too hard and difficult and expensive to hear the voices of the poor. And what I'll re respond is it's, it's an investment you can't afford not to make. You will not succeed without that. So we developed a framework, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but one of the things, you know, for those of you in this field um, know, when, when you see someone who's done impact, uh, the first question you ask them, I do, is, okay, where are the negative impacts? Where didn't things work well? 
And sometimes the answer is there aren't any negative impacts. That gives me pause for concern. It's pretty hard to have an intervention and no negative impact. So we look very carefully and sort of say what's working, what's not working. You know, certainly one of, the, one of the classics that some of you may know is, is microfinance and, uh, and Grameen and their work in, in Bangladesh and other microfinance institutions across the world. A big plus is you give people access to credit. What's a big negative? They also have debt, right? They also have debt, and if people can't pay off their debt, it can be disastrous. We did some work um, with a, a distributor of reading glasses in India, and one of the things they found, and this isn't an exact correlation, but they used women to distribute eyeglasses, uh, sort of like an Avon model, and one thing we found which seemed counterintuitive was the more successful the women were, the more sales they had, the more likely they were to drop out. Like, well, what's that about? Because if you just measure income, they're doing better. But what was happening was they were making more money. Their husbands were getting increasingly uncomfortable with kind of the change in the family dynamics and were encouraging those women to stop being entrepreneurs. And once you know, we figured this out, then you can develop strategies to engage the husbands at a much earlier stage and make sure that the most successful entrepreneurs stay in the model. Because if those entrepreneurs keep dropping out, it's a disaster. So again, it's trying to really understand it's not just economics. There can be other issues like relationships. Um, and we've used this model um, in many, many places across the globe. And it really does help organizations think more deeply about this space. Um, so what I want to do is, is, is sort of say that in the beginning I said there are kind of these three areas about having guiding principles integrated with development investments based on creating value with the poor. There are now tools, models, frameworks to enhance success. Right? So the idea is this isn't a complete de novo space where no one knows anything. There's, there is knowledge now that can help us be more successful, but we can't stop. Right. We still don't know enough. And I want to talk a little bit about at least where we're heading and give you some insights into, into at least some of the, I, what I think is the future of the domain. Um, this isn't a very good uh, map, but it does represent some of the places that, that I work at, uh, at the University of Michigan, the Davidson Institute, and the Ross School. Um, we focus on the three things I talked about, venture development, market creation, and impact assessment. And we do it through what we think of as three very interrelated activities that link kind of new understanding with impact in the field. One is, you know, we always think about developing intellectual capital. We want, you know, we're at a university. What are the new ideas? Where do we need to go? How do we keep learning? Um, the second is domain influence. How do we make sure that we share these ideas, that we're getting the word out? And then the third is, you know, how do we influence practice? So we do a lot of work in the field with our partners too, which, which helps us sort of implement our models and then find the next level of questions. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing. I know we're running a, a, a about on time, or I just have a few minutes left. So again, these are the different areas we work on. This is just sort of the knowledge creation. And if anyone's interested, I'm happy to, you know, if you're interested in a particular topic, let me know and I can send you some of these things. Um, but again, Rose thinking about what are the next questions. Ah, a little bit of self-promotion, if you will. Um, one of the things we try and do on a regular basis is bring the entire community, well, not the entire community, but the leading thinkers of the community together because you know, it's a real opportunity to build a better network. There are a lot of initiatives, a lot of smart people, a lot of things going on, but they're still too disparate and spread out. Companies need to meet other companies. They need to have better relations with nonprofits. Development organizations need to connect. So we do these summits every few years. We're going to have one in October. Um, we, you, we'd be delighted if you're able to join us. Um, this one's really about you know, what I'm talking about today. Where are we now? Where do we need to go in the future? And we, we host these on a fairly regular basis. Um, for those of you that are, are teachers, you know, what, we also think a lot about the next generation. 
So we have a lot of materials that help our students. You know, and what we're seeing, and, and we were talking earlier, um, the, you know, both I think in Japan, uh, in, in the US and in Europe, there are more and more young people wanting to do something of significance in their work. And this is one area that some are thinking about, particularly business students. Can I bring poverty alleviation into my work? And so these are just some of the things that we do. What I most want to talk about in the last minute or so that I have is just where are we going with each of these three. And what we've done is, is um, I didn't talk about um, this framework, but we've done a lot of work with, with multinationals in particular, thinking about what do you need to do to set yourself up for success? What are the strategies uh, in terms of business not model development do you need? How do you think about the resources, the structure, the metrics? How do you go about solving problems? So we do a lot of work kind of setting yourself up for success internally. I talked about this framework, you know, once you're going, what are things you need to think about? And what we're doing now is we're pushing harder on this. You know, we have uh, uh, funding from the Rockefeller Foundation and others to begin to think more deeply about the contextual nature. That we have a, uh, an idea of broadly what works. The questions now become what becomes most important in which context? Which business models you know, value you know, certain types of competitive advantage the most. So we're trying to dive in and be even more nuanced about that. And we see that as crucial in thinking about, we need to have, and there's been enough experiments now. We need to learn even more about what, what uh, ventures need for success. When we think about market creation, you know, this is an area that we're really pushing hard, but don't have a lot of information, but how can these be best used? And I think the initiative by Sasakawa by UNDP is really at the cutting edge of this to begin to think about the roles of development agencies and foundations in facilitating that. Where can they play? A lot of organizations like to be here, um, working with particular ventures, but there needs to be a lot here too, just sort of we need to build a market ecosystem as well. And then impact assessment, you know, we, we do an awful lot of work in the field and, you know, we're continuing to refine it. One of the things we're doing now, which we think is really important is what are the impacts on children? If you argue that poverty is intergenerational, what are the impacts on children? So we're doing some work in Africa on that. And then, you know, a lot of other partners um, are, are really invested in this. And, and the neat thing about this is that we're seeing that organizations, you know, really believe that understanding impact is a key to success in this space, both in terms of, of kind of being able to report what's happened, but more importantly, being able to really understand and build a better business model. So, you know, kind of guidelines for moving forward, you know, if I were to frame it up into four things, I think we need to go from prescribing to innovating. This idea that we know best to the idea that we really don't and we have to set ourselves up to learn and to get better. And, I think we need to go from building for to creating with. The idea that a lot of times um, we need not to create a model and a product far from the base of the pyramid. We need to create it with them. We need to go from this idea of dependence or independence to interdependence. We need to work much, much more closely together across sectors. And finally, the last point, you know, when we are trying to track poverty alleviation, it's not about evaluating, it's about enhancing. How do we have greater impact? So I put this back so hopefully some of you will come and visit me in Ann Arbor one day, or maybe I'll be back here, I look forward to that. But if you come and see me in Ann Arbor, you'll find this picture in my office. Um, and I, I told you in the beginning, I took this picture in Malawi in 1989. And, and it, what it does, it, it does two things. It reminds me about how lucky I am. By birth, I was brought up in, a, in, a, in an environment where I could get a good education, where I could do the things I wanted to do. And it also inspires me a little bit to say, what do I really want to achieve in my work? Can I make a difference? Can I make an impact? And for me, that's really saying, I think that there's a real synergistic opportunity for business and development to work more closely together, together for the benefit of both 
to alleviate poverty. So I'll stop there and say thank you very much. ロンドン教授ありがとうございましたえー、とここであのせっかくの機会ですのであの3つだけ、えー、直接質問を、えー、のあのちょっとコーヒーブレイク始まるのが遅くなるんですがあの3つだけ、えー、と質問を、えー、と短めの質問を取らせていただきたいと思いますので、えー、どなたかあのすみません、sorry, we decided to take just three questions. <laughs> That's a good opportunity. So,、um, どなたかあのご質問、この機会にという方、いらっしゃいますか。じゃあ、ちょっといらっしゃらないようなので、このまま進行させていただきたいと思います。はい。ああ、looks like there is no question at this point。so maybe there is。there must be some questions <笑>。I see a hand。there's one。せっかくですのであの質問をさせていただきます。JICA の高野と申します。えー、私はあの、えー、先生がおっしゃったような開発援助の機関に勤めております。えー、一つだけ質問させていただきたいのは、えっ、ー、と BOP ビジネスの関係でよくこの拡張性、今日の言葉に使われていますが、拡張性とかですね、再現性、前語であのスケーラビリティとかレプリカビリティとか言いますね。でこの BOP ビジネスのえー、がこうもっと大きくこう広がっていくメインストリーム化されるためにいろんなアクターが役割を果たすことができると思うんですがこの BOP ビジネスモデルとか BOP ビジネスモデルディベロップメントとかこういう取り組みを自体をこうスケールアップしていくためのキー鍵というのはどういうものだとお考えでしょうか、えー、と多分企業の立場開発の時間の立場で異なった。果たしうる役割があると思うんですが、えー、スケーラビリティそれからレプリカビリティについて何がキーどういうことがキーだとかお考えでしょうか、um, Thank you That's a, If I knew the complete answer If I could tell any business how to scale successfully I'd be a billionaire, right? But I can give you some insight into some of the things we're seeing that lead to a better chance for scale in the base of the pyramid. A couple of them I, I mentioned before, which is, is, is starting with a vision of scale, that we are going to scale, which means we need to develop a competitive advantage of some sort. And we also need to develop a set of capabilities that can be transferred. And what we found. Is that competitive advantage to a large extent seems to be based on building partnerships and relationships and leveraging existing platforms? And the capabilities that we see that have become increasingly important is the ability to collect, assess, and understand local markets. We call that、um, social embeddedness. But Do you have the capability fairly quickly to, to aggregate a lot of information and really interpret it? And I, I'll give you one example which comes from an organization called ITC in India. And what, what they did is they decided that they wanted to serve、um, farmers. Well, they didn't decide, they've been in, in India for years, but they decided they needed to figure out a new model to serve farmers. And they, making a long story short, targeted soy first. And what they did is they provided Local information to farmers、uh, in terms of market prices and offered to buy products、um, with, a, with a one day price forward、um, versus the existing market.、Um, it took them quite a long time to develop the model. There were a number of pilots and iterations.、Um, they did come up with a model in the end, that, which they used something called a s a n c h a l a k which is a local vill- village representative to provide pricing information. And what they were able to do was to get to buy soy at a cheaper price. And they said, okay, that's great. We're going to scale that up. And they said, if we can do that for soy, why not other products? So they started doing that for coffee and wheat and said, okay, we now have the skill to do it in one. Let's scale it to other products and other, venture,、uh, other locations. The contexts were different. So they had to, to re engineer the model, but they were building a skill、um, to do this. 
And then they said, well, if we have the ability to buy from the farmers, why can't we sell to them? And they said, let's start, because now they were beginning to really get a sense of farmer needs. They had the capability, and the farmers were saying, you know, better seeds, improved pesticide, herbicides, fertilizer. And that's good for the company, because not only are they selling to the farmers, but the produce they're buying from them is now better. And then the last thing they did, which has had a little less success, is they said, well, if we can sell agricultural products to the farmers, maybe we can sell other things. And they got into things like health care, and we're continuing to work with them in, in a number of areas. And this has been a little bit more challenging, but you know, they've gotten into all kinds of other, what look to be very dynamic things, building off their platform, financial services, um, things like that. So they're seeing that they've built this platform and this skill, and they're taking it and scale in a lot of different ways. And, and that's, you know, in a nutshell, that's kind of how I think about scale and a, and a, and a reasonable example of it. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation. My name is Sato Gan, and I'm a development sociologist, Institute of Development Economies. In your slide, uh, 20, page 26, you mentioned about the developed intellectual capital, and it's very interesting for me. And would you please explain what is the unintellectual capital in the context of BOP business? Okay. So what is intellectual capital in the context of BOP business? And I don't know, let's see. This one? One more? This one? Or the previous one? Okay. Can you go back one? I mean, so you know, when we think about intellectual capital, what we're thinking about is this is an area that we don't yet fully understand. So we want to, you know, help kind of build a greater understanding of what has worked, what hasn't worked. I, you know, I'm at a, a, a major university, so certainly part of our mandate is intellectual capital, but we want to create knowledge and frameworks that can be used in the field. So the, the, the models I gave you before with impact assessment and venture development and subsidies, those are models that we've created based on our learnings that we then share in the field. So, so that's our idea of intellectual capital, is really trying to understand what's working, what's not working, how can we help business development, nonprofits be more successful in these areas? And I think that's part of you know any new domain needs to have that happen. You know, if we just have a lot of experiments and no aggregation of learnings, you know, you, you if you will, you can reinvent the wheel. You can make the mistakes, same mistakes over and over again, and that's what we try to avoid by doing that. Did that answer your question? ありがとうございます。えっと、そこで、あ、それではここで、え、ちょっとあの、コーヒーブレイクの時間をしてるんですけれども、あの、笹川平和財団の行っておりますえ、BOP技術インキュベーションプロジェクトにつけまして、え、
えー、笹川平和財団は1986年に設立された公益財団法人でして、えー、日本財団や東京財団と同じ日本財団グループの一機関となっております。設立主の方は国際交流、国際協力、国際理解を推進する事業を支援、実施し、人類の福祉と健全な国際社会の発展に寄与する、寄与することで、世界の平和に貢献するという、えー、趣旨となってございまして、活動内容として、調査研究、えー、人物育成、人物招聘、および国際会議の開催や、えー、その他の事業活動を、えー、行っております。当,外プロあ当プロジェクトにつきましては、えー、グローバリゼーションの功罪への挑戦のプログラムの中の1プロジェクトとなってございます。えー、簡単にです、ね、プロジェクトの、あのー、ご説明をさせていただきたいと思います。えー、当財団では、えー、2012年より、えー、BOP 技術開発とインキュベーションの支援事業を開始いたしております。BOP に関するリサーチやパイロット授業を行い、その結果を広く共有するとともに、プロジェクトに企業様、NGO、NPO 様にもご参加いただける仕組みを作っていきたいと考えております。具体的には、BOP 市場において潜在力の高い技術や製品を確認し、これら,のこれらを現地の社会企業家や企業,様とあ企業様とマッチングし、インキュベーションを行うといったもので、初年度につきましては、水とエネルギーセクターに焦点を当てまして、これらの2つの分野での社会的インパクトが高く、さらにビジネスとしても成り立ちうる可能性の高い技術、およびビジネスモデルを分析しております。また2年度目につきましては、初年度のリサーチ結果をもとに、途上国にて多数の製品を用いたフィージビリティスタディを行,行う予定にしております。一つの技術のみでなく、複数の技術を実地で試すことで、各社が単独で途上国仕様に進出,進出する際には分からない技術やビジネスモデルについての示唆を得ることを目的としております。3年目につきましては、2年目までの結果を受け、ビジネス的にも社会インパクト的にも潜在力が高いと思われる技術を選択し、これを実際途上国の社会起業家や起業家とマッチングすることで、ビジネス化に対する示唆を得ようとするものです。なかなかその1年、2年のプロジェクトでインキュベーションができるというふうにはもちろん思っておらないのですが、えー、こういうような形のパイロットをです、ね、いろいろな機関の、まあ、一流の専門家の方にも参加していただいて実施することで、あのそのセクターにおける、またあのあの BOP, をビ,ジネ BOP ビジネスをあの始められる方々にとって、えー、そのセクターごとの有益な情報を得られるプロジェクトにしていきたいと考えております。次のページを見ていただくと、これはあの水分野に対する現在行っているリサーチ,リサーチについての,あの一つの例なんですけれども、このリサーチについてはです、ね、あの3月に最終報告が出てまいりますので、その時点でまた皆様とシェアさせていただきたいと考えておりますが、こちらに見られるとおり、伝統的な方法からより良い方法へということで、煮沸や布ろ過、土器での保存といったあのかなり原始的な方法からですね、塩素セラミックフィルターや活性炭素、またはあとナノテクノロジーや、えー、精密ろ過膜や超、えー、ろ過膜までこういうものをですね、あの技術的に比較しまして、えー、と利点あのまたは、えー、難しい点などを、えー、と分析していくというプロジェクトでございます。例えばですね、どの技術が家庭用レベルでの使用に適しており、どの技術がコミュニティレベルでの使用に適しているか、また、1リットルあたりのコスト、使いやすさ、メンテナンス、そういった点も合わせて分析していきます。次のスライドを見せていただきます。これ、本当にあのサンプルなんですが、見ていただきますと。例えば水技術においては、えー、まあ生物汚染に対してどれぐらい効果があるのか化学汚染に対してどれぐらい有効性があるのかというのをあのです、ね、各技術をあのごとにマッピングしたのがこの図になります、えー、割とあるようであの結構こういう分析っていうのがあのなかなか見つけることが難しいっていう点もあると思いますのでこういうものもご参考になればと思っております。えー、次のスライドをちょっと駆け足でいかせていただきますとこちらもの分析サンプルでして、えー、家庭用の浄水器を5年間使用した際にかかるコストの違いを分析したものです、えー、その前の,あのグラフを見ていただきますとその化学物質あの
あの科学的汚染と、えー、生物的汚染両方に対して一番効果を高,いあ高い効果を示した逆浸透膜だったんですが、まあ、こういう分析を見ますと逆浸透膜のコストの高さがあのかなり明らかになるということで、まあ、どの技術がどういったビジネスモデルでどういった場所にこう参入していけるのかといったような分析をこういうものからあの導き出していただけるいければと考えております。えー、と次のページなんですが、えー、とそれと同時にまあビジネスモデルの方としていくつかあの有効と思われるケーススタディも行っていく予定でございます。えー、これはユニリーバのピュアという浄水器の,あの分析ですがこのようなものもいくつかあの入れさせていっていただく予定です。で次のスライドを見ていただきますと、えー、1年目はです、ね、エネルギーセクターと水セクターということだったんですがエネルギーセクターにつきましてはです、ね、あの家庭用照明と、えー、クッキングストーブ調理用ストーブこちらの方の分析を行,あの行っておりまして、えー、例えば家庭用照明につきましてはあの薪ケロシンランプろうそくといったものからソーラーランタン、えー、家庭用ソーラーシステム風力ミニグリッドバイオマスディーゼルディーゼルミニグリッドソーラーミニグリッドこういったもののパフォーマンス技術としてのあとはマーケットとしての潜在,の可能潜在市場としての可能性またはどういった技術でどういったビジネスモデルで可能性がこういった市場で可能性があるのかそういったものを見ていく予定でございます。で最後にですね次のスライドがクックストーブの方になります。こちらはあ,のもうあらゆる種類のクックストーブが並んでおりまして私もこんなにあるって知らなかったので驚いたんですけども移動可能ロケットストーブビルトインガス化 LPG 天然ガスとかですねこういうあらゆる技術があると思うんですがこういうものを実際にあの比較してあのどのようなところに正気があるのかというところをですねあの分析していきたいと思っておりますまたあのこの結果を用いまして、えー、と2年目にはですねあのフィジビリティスタディその後インキュベーションというステップがあのステップを踏んでいく予定になってございますのであのぜひ多くの,あの日本企業様にご,今日あのご参加いただけるような形にしたいと思っておりますのであのまたあのスタディの結果が出たらご報告いたしますがいつでもあのお気軽にお問い合わせいただければと思います。